Welcome back to another edition of the Masters Club virtual event brought to you by the Royal Canadian Mint. This is the show for coin collectors and is, as always, a Masters Club exclusive. I'm happy to be your host, Alexandra Lindsay, and I'm joined by Masters Club Program Manager, Jamie Desnoshe. Welcome to our little digital rendezvous, dear members, where our connections transcend the screen. Hold on to your digital seats. We've got a great program ready for you. Jamie seems pretty excited. That's probably because we are filming at the Canada Aviation and Space Museum. That's right, Masters Club members. For this edition of our virtual event, we'll dive into our biggest theme of the year, the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Most members may not know that we have a dream team of experts working on the entire program, and we have them here. What better setting than the Canada Aviation and Space Museum in Ottawa to talk about our collection of RCF coins? What else do we have planned, Jimmy? Well, Alex, I know you had the opportunity to catch up with our engraving team. We'll be speaking with veteran engraver Samantha Strath as she teaches the Masters Club all about the finishes found on our coins. Our members often ask us about coin frosting, how we apply finishes, and why the Royal Canadian Mint is known for its frosting across the globe. I think it's time for us to tackle the art that is frosting. Lastly, will you give us a bit of a Masters Club program update, Jamie? I'm curious to hear about what you've got going on, and if you're so inclined, Maybe you can give us a preview of what's coming up in the loyalty program? I'd be happy to do that. We'll be chatting about all things Masters Club, and I have a few different things to share with you. Thanks, Jamie. I know our members will appreciate that. All right, I'm too excited to start the show. What are we waiting for? Let's start right now. There's no better time than the present. We're calling our first segment Past, Present, and Future the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Let's take off with our first guests. You're in for a unique experience as I'm joined by the team behind our 2024 collection of RCAF coins and you're privy to this Masters Club exclusive interview. Joining me here at the Canada Aviation and Space Museum are three of the members of this incredible team. We begin with a familiar face and product manager, Matt Egink, a great friend to the Masters Club. Matt, I'm sure you've got a lot of surprises in store for us. Absolutely. Fantastic. We're also joined by retired major Matt Yost. Uh, Matt, uh, would you mind uh, telling us a little bit about uh, your background and how you're involved in this team? Well, I spent 32 years in the Canadian Armed Forces. And the last 18, I was fortunate to work at the Directorate of History and Heritage, where I was one of the uh, Air Force historians. And after I retired, I was asked if I'd uh, assist with uh, all the Centennial products and support. And it's a pleasure to help with all of this. And you have a long history with the product team as well. I know myself and, and Matt have worked with you on projects, so uh, it's nice to have you here uh, joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lastly, rounding out our super crew is Colonel Maggie Jackula. Colonel Jackula, you had a very special role on this team. Uh, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and, and your role on this team? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I am the campaign manager for RCF 2024, which is the centennial team that the RCF stood up about four years ago. Uh, so it's been a great honor over that time to lead our small but mighty team of folks who are curating a year long uh, series of events to celebrate the centennial. Myself personally, I've been in the Air Force since 1997 and I am an aerospace engineer by trade. That's great. And you've been working on this for four years, this program. Coming up so, on four years, yes. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so that's fantastic. Thank you, guys. And this is really a super team. I know I've mentioned it once or twice, uh, the three of you uh, working together on this, uh, and I'm sure there's so many other people behind the scenes. But, Matt, everything starts with you. So knowing that the RCAF would be a large theme this year, uh, how did you approach your collaboration uh, with this team? And uh, where did it all start? Well, like you said, Jamie, this was something that uh, the Mint, we wanted to commemorate. Um, so uh, it started off actually with a phone call uh, with Major Jacula, uh, and then the team grew from there. Um, initially, the, the excitement uh, around the program 
uh, was mutually shared by everyone, and it was just contagious at that point. Uh, so it naturally grew into a, a coin program that I think uh, we're all quite proud of. So um, basically, Colonel Jackie, we'll go over to you. Um, April 1st, 2024 marked the 100 years of uh, service uh, for the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force uh, as a distinct military element. So we know the RCAF 2024 team are curating a year-long program, as you mentioned. Uh, do you, and your role as a campaign manager is huge in this, right? Uh, can you give our Masters Club members a little bit of a rundown of the centennial commemorations this year? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we really kicked things off back in December with the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, they created their third jersey for this hockey season, which was uh, a tribute to the RCF Flyers who had won the Olympic gold medal back in 1948. So that was a super exciting way to uh, start off the centennial. Uh, we also have uh, RCF runs happening around the world, RCF Game Force, which is a, a gaming team that's engaging with youth. Um, on the 1st of April proper, we kicked off the centennial uh, with an illumination campaign. So over 500 sites around the world in about 27 countries illuminated in blue that day. And uh, that was a really great way to get Canadians engaged in the centennial. One of the things that we want to do through the centennial is celebrate our history and heritage while inspiring future generations of Canadians to take interest in air and space. Uh, so all the different ways that we can celebrate the centennial from coast to coast have been very exciting. Uh, for folks who do want more information on the centennial website, Site, there is an events page that has an interactive map and some of the things I'm most looking forward to this summer are uh, the different air shows across the country and we're going to be joined by both the Italian and the British air demonstration teams to help us celebrate so there's a lot to look forward to this summer still. I'm, I'm surprised too like uh, you're saying it, it's it's not just contained to Canada it's global which is fantastic it must have taken a lot of coordination on your team's part too so yeah, it definitely <laughs> did. We even had uh, four RCF run uh, locations in Australia. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Matt, uh, we'll come back to you. Um, you assembled quite a team here to, to, to get these coins uh, uh, produced. So um, the, the suite of products that, that, that you were working on, is there an overarching narrative throughout the whole commemoration? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, as you know, Jamie, when we uh, issue our proof dollar, uh, proof dollar suite program every year, uh, there's several products and they usually start off with telling the history of whatever theme that it is that we're uh, commemorating uh, and that works well with the $100 gold. As you know, the $100 gold featured uh, the Tiger Moth, uh, an early uh, trainer aircraft and from there the story grew. Uh, we ended up uh, moving into more of a, a collage design which you all have seen on the proof dollar um, and then the RCF Centennial uh, knowing that was in April, uh, that was looking to the future. So uh, naturally, and I, I can't say enough and thank um, uh, Major Yost and um, Colonel Jackula enough uh, for their support, their collaboration, their ideas. Uh, it was a wonderful collaboration, uh, starting from a historical look back to the future. Uh, the way the program came together, uh, couldn't ask for better. That's fantastic. Yeah. And the, the, the amount of effort that, that the program it, it shows. And we'll get into each coin as we go because there's such a great story here that you guys have developed. So, uh, we'll, we're not going to spoil anything right away, but we'll get into all those details. So, Matt, I haven't forgotten you. Uh, considering your tenure at the Directorate of History and Heritage for the Canadian Forces, how important was it to get the story of the centennial of RCEF correct from a historical perspective? It's quite important because when you look at 100 years of history, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of events, a lot of people packed into that. And with most Canadians focusing on the present, the historical aspect becomes significant because these are the people that led the way. These are the people who created what became a very professional and capable RCIF. So to be able to tell their story even in a small way, is very important. We're going to change the gears slightly. Uh, what, now we're going to discuss each coin in the collection and unfold the story that was lovingly created by our team here in chronological order. We'll be getting into the finer details of the RCAF coins in your collection. The first coin we're going to review is the 2024 $100 pure gold coin, the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force. The reverse design by artist Neil Amney features the RCEF roundel in the background and a proud maple leaf in its center. 
The RCAF's early years are represented by the de Havilland tiger moth. So Matt, can you tell us a little bit more about the importance of starting the story with the tiger moth? I know that uh, our first coin was the gold coin. Um, the specific model displayed and why it was selected for this coin. The tiger moth is significant in the early RCAF. In the interwar period, the RCAF would only be allowed to purchase five, ten, maybe twenty of a particular aircraft. And most of them were actually civilian aircraft used in military operations. When you get to the first tiger, well, to the, to the moth at the start, you're talking January 1928. From there, the RCAF continued to buy different models of the moth until you get to the tiger moth, and they served until 1948, so a 20-year span in a period when, if an aircraft lasted five years before it became obsolete, that was actually an accomplishment. And here's an airplane that lasted 20 years in RCAF service. And then, with all the people that trained as pilots on the, on the uh, Tiger Moth, and then those that trained as radio operators on moths, it's, it's actually a major contribution by one type of airplane. And a great a fitting start to the, the whole program too, right? So to, to have that. Was the, the Tiger Moth also uh, part of the British Commonwealth the air training program? Uh, was it used for, for that kind of thing? Yes, in fact, they built just over 1,300 Tiger Moths and they were actually Canadianized. So they had canopies and better heating so that they could be flown in the winter. Yeah. But yeah, two thirds of the elementary flying training schools where they taught pilots to fly employed the uh, Tiger Moth at one time or another. And then a lot of the other smaller schools for wireless operators, for instance, they uh, employed the Tiger Moth or a variant thereof called the Manasco Moth for uh, training purposes. So Maggie, and excuse my Latin, but sic itur ad astra. Yes. It's a Latin motto and it features on many of our coins this year uh, and is prominently dis displayed on this coin's banner. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the motto, where it comes from and, and its history? So uh, obviously we have Matt here, so in case I either get the history wrong or pronounce things incorrectly, <laughs> Matt will stand in uh, to make sure it's accurate. That's why you guys are here. Exactly. Um, but the motto stands for uh, such as the pathways to the stars, and it started out as the motto of the Canadian Air Force in 1920, so prior to the establishment of the RCAF. When the RCAF did um, come into existence on the 1st of April, 1924, they actually adopted the motto of the RAF, and it wasn't until 1975 that we returned to this motto, which is such as the pathway to the stars. So we thought it was really important to have that on the coin, because while it obviously has a rich history for the RCAF, uh, the fact that we're saying such as the pathway to the stars really alludes to the future as well. Yeah, and, and you see that narrative throughout all of these coins, which is really cool, and I'm not gonna spoil anything right now, but it, at the same time, you know, it's, it's it's a reoccurring theme and, and you kind of see where it's going to as, uh, as uh, we get into the coin. So moving along this incredible timeline created by this team, we'll explore the 2024 fine silver proof dollar and set the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force. So Matt, you and I did a deep dive on the proof dollar uh, in uh, December in our live stream with a master's club. Uh, we went over all the details, but for the benefit of those who missed it, we'll, uh, we'll show a little bit of, uh, of that footage. I think the first thing we, we definitely wanted to capture uh, is the RCF roundel. So in the center of the coin, you have the large uh, maple leaf and around the perimeter of the, of, the, of the coin on the outside is a large frosted band. And that's, uh, that's the RCF roundel and it actually anchors the whole design. So starting from left to right, uh, the small aircraft on the left, just below uh, the N in Canada, uh, is a Tiger Moth, and that represents the early years of the RCAF. Right. Uh, next to the Tiger Moth, uh, to the right, um, is the CF-18 Hornet, which represent, represents their fighter fleet. And then next to the, uh, uh, the Hornet, we have the Hercules, which represents their fixed wing fleet. And then just to the right of, uh, of the Hercules, we have uh, the Chinook, which represents their helicopter fleet. I'd say of all the elements that we had to bring into the design, the yep. tartan was probably the most challenging. It was. Because, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, make it 
look like the tartan and and fit well within the design with when there's so many other elements so yeah. uh the artist uh, did a really great job where he took the uh the smoke trail of three of the aircrafts uh and built it into the tartan this is sort of giving the idea that the smoke trail is forming and building the tartan yeah. uh so the the smoke trail is engraved but if you look at the tartan um the tartan is laser engraved so it's, mm -hmm. it's a different look altogether so the raised relief from the smoke trail builds into the the flat relief of the the laser engraved tartan and they come together really well then the tartan is what exactly uh would that uh, it's the official rcef tartan or that's correct okay it, it's uh it's their official tartan and if you look at the outside of the design mm -hmm. um the tartan is stylized yeah but as you get closer to the round l and it's only appropriate mm -hmm. uh, to the center maple leaf as you get closer to the maple leaf, uh, the actual official tartan is just below. Just to the right of the Chinook, uh, you'll see some planets and orbital rings, uh, and those represent uh, the space division of yep. the RCAF. Okay, yeah. And then also uh, in that same area, we have three stars, and those stars represent the RCAF's uh, current uh, motto. So Matt, I had a great time speaking to you about that design and uh, you put a lot of care into it. And uh, now we know that you weren't alone in that creation. So we get the full story. So Maggie, when it comes to uh, that design, it has a little tulip on the bottom. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that tulip? I know Matt went to detail a little bit, but uh, I think that, uh, that you, uh, your expertise is probably best here. Well, as you alluded to, uh, that coin has so many different elements to it. And one of the reasons that I was excited to include the tulip, which was the rescue tulip, um, is that the Tulip Festival here in Ottawa is celebrating the centennial by having the theme of the 2024 Tulip Festival be 100 years of the RCAF. So by including the one tulip, we were able to then sort of incorporate all four of the RCF themed tulips that the Tulip Festival has. So in addition to the rescue tulip, um, there is a yellow trainer aircraft, a white Ad Astra tulip, as well as a uh, red flyers tulip. So it was just a really great uh, opportunity to incorporate that collaboration as well. So there are several uh, aircraft featured on this coin, such as the Tiger Moth, the Hornet, the Hercules, and the Chinook. Uh, why were these aircraft selected and why are they important to portray on this design? One of the problems we face in trying to design any coin that represents the RCAF is that we have well over 200, in fact, closer to 250 different models of aircraft that we've used since 1924. And with all the roles that we've had, whether it's transport, search and rescue, trying to be representative becomes difficult. So each aircraft was picked based on representing one or more roles or having a greater significance, hence the Tiger Moth, as we've already talked about. Now with the Hornet, it's been around since 1985 and originally it was supposed to be air defense, but we've used it in so many m more roles. We've used it in Libya, in uh, the Gulf War, and it's still is a very good aircraft and our pilots are showing that we are still capable of world-class efforts. The Hercules, it's been around in different models since October 1960 and originally it was just a tactical airlift aircraft but it's become so much more. I mean we're using it for search and rescue, humanitarian operations around the world. So it too has a significance not just to the people of Canada where it may have helped evacuate people from floods or fo forest fires. So it is the epitome of transport aircraft. Whereas the Chinook, it's a transport helicopter, but it too has been used for other operations. In April, we launched the stunning 2024 $20 silver coin, the Royal Canadian Air Force Centennial. Uh, so that's our next stop in this narrative. A salute to the RCF's 100 years of service the reverse design by artist David Moore spans three different eras of RCEF aircraft history. Backed by angular shapes conveying speed and motion, two of the aircraft speak to the RCEF's past. This one is a stunning coin with some Art Deco flair and definitely one of my favorites. Don't tell anyone. So uh, when we look at this one here, um, the uh, F-35 Lightning II at the center of the coin, uh, inspired the, that sort of lightning bolt background and is prominently featured in the foreground. Uh, it's like a sleek and modern aircraft. 
can you tell us a little bit about that aircraft featured on its coin and what it represents to the RCEF? So when we looked at this coin and we really wanted with it being the third in the series to sort of look to the future, uh, the commander of the RCAF, uh, General Kenny, uh, was quite keen to have the F-35 on the coin because it represents the future of the RCAF. Uh, we are in a, a period of uh, extreme modernization right now with the F-35 aircraft coming on board, the P-8 aircraft coming on board. and so. Having the F-35 on this coin really signifies the future of the RCAF because in just um, you know 10 years, by the time we get to 2035, the fleets in the RCAF are going to have undergone uh, an extreme amount of change, and that's what this coin is supposed to represent. Representing the, the, the future, as we were kind of implying before. There are two planes in the background be, be behind the uh, F-35. Um, and Matt, I'll come on your expertise again. Uh, so the two aircraft that are flanking the F-35, what are those two planes and why are they important? The two aircraft are the Sopwith Camel and the Supermarine Spitfire. Now, the Camel is probably considered the epitome of First World War fighter aircraft. It was a handful to fly and it was an outstandingly maneuverable aircraft. A lot of Canadian pilots flew it and five of the top 10 Canadian aces during the war actually flew the Camel, including uh, William Barker, Victoria Cross winner. The RCF used it from 1920 up to 1929, and it was used as an advanced fighter trainer at Camp Borden. Now, when we get to the Spitfire, it's usually associated with the Battle of Britain, but there were only a few Canadians that flew the Spitfire during that battle. However, by the time you get to 1944, 14 of the 17 day fighter squadrons that the RCF had in the UK and in the Mediterranean theater were operating the Spitfire. And I don't know how many of them realized it, but that beautiful elliptical shape to the wings that characterizes the Spitfire, those were actually designed by a Canadian by the name of uh, Bev Shenstone. Okay, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that myself, so oh, that's interesting, yeah. Finally, to wrap up this story, we end on a set that has not yet seen the light of day. For this last entry in our numismatic collection and a sneak preview to, for the program, we will look at the 2024 special edition silver dollar proof set, the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force. So Matt, the last piece of your uh, RCEF uh, centennial program is still hidden. Uh, most people haven't seen it yet. Uh, so you're doing a sneak preview as you did last time and it's very much appreciated. Would you mind uh, unveiling this coin for us and telling us a little bit about it? Uh, it's an honor. Um, uh, the, the way the program, uh, as far as the numismatic uh, program goes, uh, I think it's very appropriate uh, to come out with the special edition silver dollar, which highlights and I think um, uh, pays uh, respect to the RCF personnel. Uh, so the RCF badge um, was it was a piece that our engravers were even excited about because these types of this type of artwork I should say uh, always strikes up really well on a coin. Maggie, if you don't mind, uh, we'll dive into that a little bit more. So that that um, that badge, uh, how important is it to to you and your team? Uh, it was really important to me, and I loved it uh, when Matt suggested that this be uh, the the last one in the numismatic. Uh, uh, collection because the RCF badge truly does represent the people of the RCAF. We all wear it on our cap badges. And uh, one of the things that I like to talk about in the centennial, I'm very fortunate to have that opportunity, is a lot of Canadians think about pilots and planes when they think of the RCAF. And without a doubt, those are two very key elements of the RCAF. Uh, but there are over 75 trades of personnel who work with um, the planes and the pilots in order to allow them to do all the things that they do. So this badge is a really great way, this coin, to celebrate all of those individuals and uh, shed light on all the great folks within the RCAF. Yeah, I agree, yeah, and, that's, and it's just the perfect bookend to that. So uh, well done, guys. One other thing, Jamie, I wanted to mention about the special edition proof set is this is the first time in several years where we're featuring a new coin as the silver dollar within that set. Typically, we, we use the, the proof dollar design without the plating, and that goes in the set. This year, uh, we've put the exclusive design, it being the RCF badge, uh, struck and proof finish in that set. 
And it's only in that special edition proof set that you can get this coin. Yeah. I think the last time we did that was with the end of the Second World War. That was a, so it's been quite a few Long years. Time. Yeah, so f fantastic work on that. That's it. And it makes it more special to the set in the sense that it's uh, the only place you can get uh, that special edition proof dollar, right? So That's fantastic right. work, yeah. Just hearing all of your, your stories has been fantastic. Uh, Maggie, when I look at you, I hear rumors that uh, either you're a coin collector or you have someone on your team that's also a Masters Club member. Is that true? Yeah, and that's why this has been so exciting. Me, obviously, I am exceptionally grateful to the Mint uh, for all of these coins. They're amazing. It has t completely blown my mind and my expectations, and it has given us uh, such an opportunity to talk to Canadians about the history of the RCAF and about the centennial. Uh, so professionally, it's been amazingly rewarding. But on a personal note, uh, for myself and our team, it's been a really cool opportunity. Master Master Trent Paulus, who I'm sure is watching this, is a Master Club member, and uh, he has loved seeing uh, all of this come to life. And, um, you know, I think over the last more than a year, our connection uh, with Matt and others at the Mint, is it's more than... Um, just a working relationship. It feels like a family. And so uh, Matt took the opportunity to take all of the team, including uh, Master Master Trent Paulus, uh, for a tour of the Mint to see where our coins are being made. And that was really amazing. Um, and then even more personally, my 10 year old son, Greg, is a budding uh, coin collector. And uh, he has loved all of the coins that when they come to our house even though i've ordered them they become his okay. <laughs> and uh we've had the opportunity to go down to the mint a few times i'd love to give a shout out to christopher as well he is an exceptional guide and has really uh helped greg uh, make sure he has all the right um books and protection and things like that for his coins and uh, it's been really great opportunity the last three and a half years I have worked a lot um, on the centennial and yet this is one of the things that I can share with my son and we get to have time together and build those relationships and those memories over the this whole collection so um, for very many reasons I am grateful for this and when it's personal like that too you've invested your your own you have your own story in those coins too too. not only the, the story of the RCEF, but it's it's your own history too, right? So, and Matt Egg, you, you know all too well how that works, right? So most of us uh, that have worked at the Mint uh, are very invested in our stories, and we'd love to share those stories too. We're very proud of you all, all three of you, and you've done such a fantastic job on this, and thank you so much for spending your, your time with us and telling our stories for our Masters Club members. Uh, so thank you again, and uh, fantastic work to the three of you. Thank you. All right, next let's join Alexandra on a journey to discover more about the art of frosting on our coins. I'm pleased to be joined by veteran engraver Samantha Strath, who will speak to us about a quiet art form in coining, the application of frosting. Many Masters Club members have requested we dive into this with our famous engravers and we're happy to oblige. Samantha, tell us a bit about your tenure at the Royal Canadian Mint. How long have you been an engraver? Uh, I have been doing this now for 13 years. Wow, that's a long time. I know you're, we're in good hands for this segment. Let's start with the basics. Can you explain to us what exactly is frosting on coins? Mm -hmm. So um, it's essentially just applying a texture to the coin surface or to the dies that we use to strike the coins um, to create a different sort of look, whereas uh, the metal on its own, once it's polished, is very shiny. So we apply some texture to it to give it uh, a slightly, maybe a matte surface um, and to make it look a little less shiny in different areas. Nice, they add a little bit dynamic to our coins. Can you explain to our members why we use frosting on coins? Yes. So. Um, the two main reasons are, one is it differentiates different elements of the coin. Um, so for example, you might have a person in the foreground and trees behind them. Um, and if the trees are very busy, you don't want their face to sort of get lost in that. So we might put different frosting on the two elements to differentiate them. Um, and then also to give a little bit more of a lifelike quality uh, to things. For example, a harsher frosting might make the metal appear a little lighter or almost whitish. Uh, so we might use that for snow or something like that that we want to appear lighter. Interesting. How many frosting variations do we have? 
Uh, for numismatic coins, we have five main variations. Um, there will be shiny on a flat surface, um, so like the background of a coin, uh, shiny on engraved relief. Um, the next level is a sort of satiny texture. It's a very, very light texture. Uh, the next level will be a matte texture. It's a little heavier. And then the fifth level is a very heavy matte texture that gives it a much lighter, uh, almost sort of whitish look. How does the engraving team approach the application of frosting? Um, a great question. So typically we'll have a conversation with the product managers from the get-go to see uh, what ideas they had in mind. Uh, we'll look at the artwork as well while we talk with them and see what might lend itself to different types of frosting. Um, for example, choosing to make the water shiny, uh, maybe make snow, uh, a very harsh frosting so it has a white look to it. Um, and then as we're sculpting, we'll keep that in mind for things like um, little details, say buttons on a jacket or facial features. We have to make sure that they're really strong enough to stand out under, underneath the frosting. I'm sure that different frosting types are used for different known or repeated elements on coins. What are the staples used by the engraving team in terms of frosting? Uh, yes, yeah, so typically um, for water, we'll leave it shiny um, so that it has a look of, uh, say, a lake of water reflecting. Uh, and it also has a darker, almost sort of blackish look to it in terms of um, color, if you want to say. Um, and then for things like snow, we'll use a harsher frosting, a uh, very, very textured frosting because that gives the metal a sort of whitish look, um, maybe for clouds as well. Uh, so those are some of the go-tos. Um, typically for text, we'll use a matte frosting as well, uh, just to make it pop out from whatever relief might be behind it. Fascinating. Let's take a few moments to look at a specific and recent example. To our Masters Club members, if you have this coin in your collection, I invite you to follow along. Armchair Travelers, this classic Canadian coin is a $20 fine silver coin. This is Canada, Wondrous Waters, Arctic Coast. This snapshot of the Arctic is the second of four Wondrous Water coins issued in 2024, with each piece featuring a different view of the bodies of water that surrounds Canada. Samantha, let's explore the finishes of this coin a bit, as I see several different applications of frosting. Yes, so as we've spoken about earlier, you can see the water on this one has been left shiny. Um, so it has a beautiful look of water reflecting on a lake. Um, the snow in the background is the, uh, the hardest frosting, the most intense frosting to give it almost a sort of white look. Um, and then all the elements in the foreground, the owl, the bear, the person, they're in uh, a sort of satiny texture. So slightly less intense than the snow behind them, um, but still enough to sort of make them pop on the coin as well as the text on the coin and all the little compass points. Those are also, uh, it looks like in a matte texture to make them really pop uh, against the shiny background. Wow, so many frosting elements to make one beautiful coin. Last question. You've worked on the frostings of many coins over your tenure. Which one was the most difficult or a real challenge? Likely Champlain's Astrolab. That one was uh, a really, really tough one in large part because it was a direct dye. So we didn't have the chance of working on it in the positive state as we would on a matrix punch. Um, and it had all those tiny little compass points around the outside or the points of the Astrolab, 360 tiny little lines around the outside of it that I had to get into to polish um, because they were uh, shiny. They had to be perfectly shiny. So that was, a, I think the entire coin actually was mostly shiny uh, and all tiny, tiny little elements. So that was a really, really complicated one, um, but beautiful in the end. I'm, proud of that one. Wow. For our members, if you have this in your collection, go take a look. Samantha, you've been so informative and helpful. I'm sure our Masters Club members now understand frosting a little bit better, and I know I do. I may have to revisit some of my older coins in my own collection to see how frosting was applied, and now that you've given us all this knowledge, I think our Masters Club members should do the same. I'm glad I got to sit down with Samantha to discuss frosting. It's such an interesting subject of which most of us are unaware. However, it's now time for a Masters Club update. Jimmy, what's new in the Masters Club loyalty program? As always, I'm excited to share some news with our members. We're continuing to strive to make your coin collecting journey a fun and engaging one. That's why we do these virtual events. As a Masters Club insider, I'll give you the scoop on the latest 
and things that you can expect in the next while. First, let's start with the 2023 edition of the Annual Collection Book. I had heard the Annual Collection Book was actually a Masters Club member's idea. That is true. Uh, that member loved the books we produced in the mid 2000s and asked us to bring a similar version of those books back. We did just that in 2020 and we've been trying to improve it year over year. I think it's a solid memento for our members and it's a nice way to recap the entire year in coining with the Royal Canadian Mint. I like to think of it as our yearbook. A lot of nice memories with some great coins. It's a great way of looking at it. What I like best about the book is the exclusive content and stories that are found only in these pages. There's some great stories in this edition as we dove into the making of the Kit Coleman Proof Dollar, National Indigenous Peoples Day, the number two construction battalion, and of course, the allegory of peace, which is an R&D marble. But what are these transparent pages? Actually, that's some of my favorite parts of the book and an ex extension to the storytelling. We like to say a great coin is a, a work of art and a great work of art has a story. Uh, most of our customers never see the original artwork from our coins, but it oftentimes is just so beautiful, it needs to see the light of day. Within the annual collection book, you'll find special transparent pages that showcase the original artwork. The cover looks beautiful and premium. I'm guessing the passing of Queen Elizabeth II features pretty prominently. It was a big moment in Canadian history, and we would have been remiss not to commemorate it in detail. Because of that, the annual collection book is a special edition of sorts. It marks the passing of a dynasty from Queen Elizabeth II to His Majesty King Charles III. And it's a snapshot of our coins for that special occasion. I know we have a lot of history buffs within the Masters Club that collect coins uh, to mark historical occasions. I like getting into details with you when we meet face to face. And as an armchair historian, this is a nice way to commemorate the end of an era and how it figured onto our coins. It's really a special edition of the book. Speaking of special edition, does this special edition uncirculated set still come with this book? Open up that front page and you'll see, you bet it does. We started doing this in 2021 and it's been something that our members have loved. On the inside cover is the special edition uncirculated set that is a book exclusive. The six coins represent the year's biggest commemorations in their colorized and non-colorized formats. That means two $2 National Indigenous Peoples Day coins. That's two 100th anniversary of the birth of Jean-Paul Riopel and two $1 coins honoring Elsie McGill. That set is the cherry on top of this book. I feel it is too. Add to the mix the poster, which was another Masters Club member request and the tighter mintage of 3,500 copies. And I think this may be the best iteration yet. I'd say. It also doesn't hurt that Masters Club members get a discount, right, Jimmy? Why pay full price? A discount on this book is a Masters Club benefit after all. Members of every level enjoy a special discount on the annual collection book. 25% off for bronze, silver, and gold. 50% off for platinum and prestige. And if you're a Diamond or Diamond Elite member, you likely already received your book for free. <gasps> it's one of the many perks that come with being a Masters Club member, of course. What do you like best about the book? We take so many beautiful images of our coins. It's uh, something we've been doing really well in the last few years. These sort of lifestyle photographs that uh, deserve to be in print as far as I'm concerned. It's lovely to see them on social media and on the web but preserving them in a book format is a nice touch. We have hundreds of lovely photographs of our 2023 coins that make this book feel really premium. Thanks for the rundown of the annual collection book, Jamie. Lastly, I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss the historic transition of the effigy on our coins. While we've been talking about the creation of the new effigy and the work it took into transitioning into the new era, it's nice to have some tangible coins with a new obverse featuring His Majesty King Charles III. I brought a few examples as I'd like to record this for posterity. For a generation, 
We were used to seeing the effigy of Queen Elizabeth II on our coins, and while we will become accustomed to this new effigy, the change is still fresh. Many of you are new members to the Masters Club or have come back to the hobby of coin collecting with the transition of the effigy. We wanted to take a moment to bear witness to these monumental changes. We had our first proof dollar with the new effigy, our first circulation coins featuring His Majesty King Charles III, and our first bullion coins as well featuring him on the obverse. We've also marked the last of the standard effigies of Queen Elizabeth II on our coins very recently. While I'm sure her effigies will return in some form on tribute coins in the future, 2024 is the last year that this effigy is the standard for numismatics, circulation, and bullion coins. Take a moment to mark this occasion, one that you'll remember for years to come. As a coin collector myself, I've been marking this transition from a historical perspective, as of many of you. Our collections are curated pieces of history and are oftentimes passed on to other family members. So don't forget to document the transition as you see fit. Pass on that history and remember this moment, fellow numismatists. We've had a wonderful time and I hope you have too. A heartful thank you to all the Masters Club members. If you enjoyed the program, drop us a like, and we'd love to hear from you in our comment section. Maybe you have an idea for an upcoming program. Let us know all about it by leaving your comment below. Next time, why not join our live stream? You'll get much more content and greater opportunities for advantages not seen in this version. Don't miss out. We'll see you at our next Masters Club virtual event. See you next time. Bye.